wound already ruined A stone cold dead head as I stepped out of the womb By his grace I have been touched By his word I have been healed By his hand I've been delivered With his spirit I've been sealed I'm saved
skies will break Kings and queens will shake Yes, it's true because we've been touched by a greater thing. We're running after you, Lord, with all our hearts, with all our soul and all our might. All we have is yours, Lord. Every word, every breath, every beat of our heart is yours. Oh, we want to change the world for you, Jesus. We want to make history because we love you. I love you, Jesus. I love you. 
love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus.
just tell you, Father, I love you. Father, I adore you. Father, I love you. You lift me up. You turn me around. You took a loser and made a winner out of me. Oh, it's only because of your love, Lord Jesus.
I see the Lord. He is high and up. And angels cry, Holy, holy is the Lord. <laughs> yes, angels cry.
Spirit say and the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. center standing. We're going to do something tonight. I know there's, um, with uh, the amount of people we have here tonight, there's thousands of problems. There's many things that are going on below the surface. I um, did a radio interview just a few minutes before coming to the meeting tonight, and um, one, of the, one of the interviewer's question was, um, Steve, I've seen some of the altar calls at the Brownsville. I've seen some of it at Wake America, and he said, what is going on? And I, I told him, I said, below the surface, you don't know what's going on in a man's heart. We have a way of putting on a facade, a face. People don't know what's going on inside. You heard from the testimonies tonight, the baptismals, people that they were living one life in front of folks and living another life behind closed doors. And so there's stuff going on. I know that. Many of you are here for the, matter of fact, how many of you here, this is your first week at Revival. Lift up your hand. Lift it up high. I know in the family, God bless you. You can put your hand down. I know in the Family Life Center there's probably even more than there are here that this is your first time. And what we're going to do tonight, see, God is, God, is, God is working miracles in this place. 
And I, those of you that are here for the first time, some of you have already been healed. You've already been healed just through Lindell's worship as he led us to the throne room of God. And there's, we've had so many testimonies, Lindell, of people being healed during your worship. During, and, just, and Lindell, it's not, he, he, would, he would never say it's his worship, or he, he even backs off on being called the worship leader and all. He just worships God. And as you focus on Jesus, friends, shackles fall off. Yes. Healings take place. Yes. Healings take place. Now, I got a word a few minutes ago. One of the staff members uh, in our ministry came up to me and said, there's someone here with an eye problem. Maybe you have some type of patch over your eye. Maybe you have some type of sickness in your eye, and you don't know, you don't know what's going on. You don't know uh, it, it, why it's happened to you. Or I don't know anything about the injury. God didn't reveal anything to us. There may be more than one. There may be folks in the Family Life Center like this. But God is here to heal you. He can heal you. And I want to tell you what you need to do. You need to test God. I mean, go, go, go test God and, and, and see what God has done in your life. And we believe in this. As a matter of fact, when somebody comes and says that God's touched him for cancer, we send them immediately, immediately to the doctor. We tell them to go have an x-ray. We want to see where the tumor was and now where it isn't. Friend, let me tell you, that's not a lack of faith. If you couldn't bend over and God's just touched you, faith is bending over. That's, it's, faith is not standing there going, I'm healed, and you're afraid to bend over. Faith is bending over and showing the world that Jesus Christ has healed me. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But we're going to do something right now. Everyone's standing. I'm going to have, um, Scott, we're going to blow this shofar. And... Um, this is not something we do all the time at Brownsville. For those of you that think this is a secret of revival, this is not the secret of revival. This is a, this is a horn off an animal. And, um, but it does signify some victories uh, in the Word and some upcoming uh, tremendous victories for the church. Matter of fact, there's a, how many are waiting for some trumpet to sound soon? Yes, Lord! But I always use one illustration. It's the one we all can recall best of the sounding of the horns, the shofar, and that is the walls of Jericho. And what I like the most about the walls of Jericho is that the walls of Jericho were impossible to tear down. The children of Israel were not equipped to do anything to the city of Jericho. And whatever you are thinking right now concerning your problem, how insurmountable it is. It can be a mountain in front of you. I want you to imagine what the children of Israel must have been going through. What they do, march around six times, Mike. The seventh day, they marched around seven times. Okay, and God said, let out a shout, and they sounded the shofar. Now that in, a, in, in, in man's mind is ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense at all, but there's a lot of things God does. He doesn't consult you. And I'm glad he doesn't consult me, friend. I'm glad he does things his way, the way he wants to do it. And what we're going to do, we're going to sound this shofar, and I want you to think of every problem that you're going through, problems that your neighbors are going through, situations that the walls have got to come down. Those here that are bound with drugs and alcohol, tonight God can totally set you free. And when he blows this, I want you to let out a shout like you've never let out before, all right? Ready? <laughs> Yes, Lord! 
This is, we haven't, Lyndall and I have not discussed this, but I want to do something. How many have lost loved ones? Lift your hand. We're going to do something. Scott, hang out. Don't, don't leave with that horn. There's a, there's a song that um, Lyndall uh, leads us in. It's called Come. And we, talk, we call to the north, the south, the east, and the west. How many have family in the north? Family in the east? Family in the west? Family in the south? That's my family. They're all over. Now, I've seen miracles in my immediate family. They've all been saved since the revival started. But we have a lot of extended family. My wife's family, there's a lot of her family that needs to be saved. So we're not, we're not slowing down. We're not giving up. And so we're going to sound this show far. And Lynn, I want you to lead us just in the chorus of that song. And we're going to call them in. Friend, look here. I know... I know many of you are concerned for yourself. You want God to touch you. You want him to bless you, and he will. But when you tap into what God is interested in, God's interested in souls. That's what he's in. The Bible says he that win his souls is wise. And if he's healed you tonight, he has healed you so you can testify and win souls. Everything has to do. Jesus shed his blood on the Calvary that people might become part of the family of God, be forgiven. It's all about souls. We're going to shout one more time and then Linda will lead us. <laughs> Just for a minute, everyone in the Family Life Center, be seated. Everyone in this main sanctuary. Hallelujah. Whew. Glory. If God, has t it's g if God has touched you already, please, please help me right now. Don't make too much noise right now, okay? Because we're going to talk about something really important. If God's touched you. If you can absolutely cannot control yourself, just dismiss yourself and hang out in the hallway for a few minutes. We well, haven't even been touched by God where you made a noise. <laughs> Friend, I've been in restaurants before where I'm just sitting there, you know, and I order the meal. Everything's just fine, and all of a sudden, oh! You like that guy in the baptism tonight? It's scary, friend. I mean, it's like, just get touched.
left his father's throne above so free so infinite his grace he emptied himself of all but love and he bled for Adam's helpless ways amazing love how can it be that thou my God should die for me amazing love how can it be that thou my God should die for me night but the light of God diffused a quickening rain and when I woke up my dungeon flame with light my chains fell off my heart was free I know it's my chains fell off Everyone, everyone standing, those in the family life stand, we welcome everyone at home, those of you listening by radio, we welcome you, yes. hallelujah. hallelujah. We're going to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts and change our lives in just a few minutes. Charity is going to be singing Mercy Seat, those of you that are away from God, those of you need a special touch from Jesus, he'll forgive you, he'll wash you, he'll cleanse you. He'll make you brand new. Don't leave out of this revival with sin in your heart. Let me say that again. Don't leave out of this revival with sin. One of the greatest frustrations I have as an evangelist when we lived for seven years in Argentina is I watch people get blessed. They get blessed. They get stuff from God, and they, then they live wickedly. And it just, it's the biggest frustration, I guess, of a pastor and, or an evangelist of anybody that's living for God to see that hypocrisy. And people will take biblical principles and, you know, they'll, they'll even take their kids and they'll send them off to church and let them learn the ways of the Lord and the parents will be get back at home and they're receiving the benefits of the church. The parents will be back at home drinking, won't be committed to God. And it's so frustrating, friend. Tonight, if there's sin in your life, make sure you get it out. Because that would bless God. Amen. We're going to pray and ask the Lord to speak to our hearts and to change our lives. Everyone pray out loud with me right now. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart, speak to my heart. Change my life. Change my life. In, your name, in your precious name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 13.
We preach from the Bible here. Just want to make that, get that straight before, for those of you that are expecting me to pull out the Quran or, or Newsweek or something. We preach from the Bible. And I happen to use tonight King James, but we also, for quite a while, preach from the New American Standard. For those of you that are just hung on one version, be ye hung. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I tell you, friend, when you travel overseas and you go places where there's never been a Bible, you go to places where they don't know who King James was. They don't know what the living Bible is. They don't know a new American, new American standard. You stand in front of people like that and they go, I'm preaching tonight from the new American. They're looking at you like, what is a new American standard? What is a new international version? What is the amplified? They don't have a Bible at all. And so uh, oftentimes uh, when we've held crusades in areas that were spiritually, where there was spiritual drought, uh, I wouldn't hold up a Bible I would just stand and I'd paraphrase scriptures and I would say things like this I want everyone here to know that 2,000 years ago a man shed his blood on Calvary for you he shed his blood on a cross a cruel cross he died for you and it was written 2,000 years ago that God so loved you everyone here that he gave his only son, his only son. And if you'd believe in this man who was crucified, you would not perish when you die, but you'd have everlasting life. See, that's not King James, that's not New American, that's not living, that's just paraphrase. That's just the word. And it's amazing what happens. People will sit out there and start to cry. Then you give an altar call, they come down and they weep before the Lord. And they got just as saved as if I was reading Greek or reading Hebrew or reading from the original text or reading from King James, they get saved because truth is truth. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now turn with me to 1 Corinthians 16, 13, a few pages. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men or act like men, be strong. Now turn with me to Hebrews. Hebrews, say Hebrews. A few pages to your right. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. This message is for those who have never known the Lord, for those who are backslidden, for those who are religious but don't know Jesus, and for those who know the Lord and are living in victory. Okay? This message is for everybody. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every, say every, every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God for consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds let us lay aside every weight and the sin with dust so easily beset us. Now, I'm going to um, use an illustration tonight. Is that okay? The other night, we had an incredible deliverance in this church. And I love deliverances. I love miracles. I love signs, and I love wonders. But we had a child 
delivered. A little child, wasn't really little, had grown up a little bit, delivered from their blankie. Now, Charlie, I want you to give me the blankie. Okay. Let me tell you something about this blankie, friend. This blankie was a serious blankie. This blankie went everywhere the child went. This blankie was sure to go. <laughs> I can't imagine. It looks like it went into the bathtub, out of the bathtub, in the yard. Everywhere the kid went, this blankie went. How many would agree with me? This blankie. And so to be delivered from a blankie like this, Mike, I would venture to say this is a major victory. This is the book of Acts level, Mike said. The book of Acts. Now, maybe for you, it's not a blankie. Maybe it's your teddy. By the way, this message is entitled, God Wants Your Blankie. What do you think about this crowd? Whoa. You think God wants to deliver everybody from their blankie? How about from their teddy? <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna set him up there. You guys will look at him. Just pay attention. But here's the problem. There's always a problem. Many of you that don't know the Lord, you've got something you're holding on to that's keeping you back from God. Something that's holding you, something that's got you bound. It could be pride. It could be drugs. It can be alcoholism. It can be bitterness. It could be a, an upraising. You, maybe maybe you, were, you, you were raised in a church or raised in a home where you were beaten. You were, you were abused by a father, a stepfather, a stepmother. And you, now you're in your 20s, and they're long gone. You've moved away. But that bitterness has been your excuse that horrendous two or three years with them, the abuse, the incest, whatever took place, has been like a security to you. And every time something goes wrong in your life, you say something like this, well, I was abused as a child. I was abused as a child. I'm so sick and tired, friend, of hearing about dysfunctional families. Every family is dysfunctional. I heard one the other day say to me, just, well, I guess it was just a dysfunctional family. And I looked at her and I said, you had a wonderful upbringing. Yeah, but there was arguments in the house and stuff. Welcome to life, friend. But you've got something that you're holding on to. Now, we're going to move forward tonight. How many want to move forward tonight? Paul, these scriptures, and there's so many as I began studying this this morning. God gave this to me at 6 a.m. this morning. And as he spoke to me these words, friend, I started searching the scripture, and there's so much on Christian maturity. There's so much on growing up in God. Many of you that don't know the Lord, it's time for you to grow up. It's time for you to quit blaming everybody else for your problems. It's time for you to quit blaming the president, blaming politicians. It's time for you to quit blaming the economy. It's time for you to quit blaming the police. It's time for you to quit blaming your parents. It's time for you to stand up and make it on your own. And God's going to help you tonight. But here's where a lot of us are at. We ready back there? A lot of us are right here. Forty-seven years old. 
Pastor, 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 help me. Pastor, somebody got my pew. I'm never going back to that church. The pastor didn't shake my hand. You're right, honey. We need to find a different place. They don't appreciate us there. I wanted to sing a solo in the choir. But they picked someone that sings worse than I do. Boy, I wish it was that easy in real life. <laughs> How many mamas wish it was that easy in real life? Just nip it, cut, quit. But I want you to move from that tonight. Now we're gonna take a, this is a giant leap for man right here, not, a, not one small stuff, it's a giant leap. I want you to go from that tonight to this. To this. <laughs> to. different. Turn that up. Get up, get up, get up. I like that. That ain't baby food. Things are changing. Things are changing. Hey, we moving forward? From Blanky to Reveille, that's a change right there, friend. Could you imagine joining the military? <laughs> All right, front and center. <laughs> but it's sure like that. I tell you what, in the Christian Army, I've seen a lot of folks just like that. Listen up in the overflow in the Family Life Center. God's going to speak to you tonight. Those of you at home, God has already spoken to you. Don't change the channel and don't get ticked. Don't get upset. Just let the Lord change you. Then it gets a little bit heavier. That's just getting up in the morning in the military. See, we got another one here. Charge! Charge! Glory! Hey, it's getting heavy now. Drop your blankie, man. I got one more. I think we do. Wait, Mark. How about this? Hi. Hey, I'm in the army now. are changing. Somebody's growing up. Somebody's turning around. Somebody's going to make something out of themselves. They've laid it all down. They've put away childish things. Oh. God wants to take your bow tie booties and trade them for leather lace combat boots. God wants, wants to take your milk and trade it for meat. God wants to exchange your lukewarm bottle for red hot battle. God wants to take your pacifier and trade it for a plow. God's had it with singing you lullabies. He wants to start hearing your war cries. God. And it's going to get heavy in just a minute, so you need to shout now, okay? God wants to take your plastic little baby spoon and trade it in for a steel sharp battle sword. 
God, God wants to stop burping you and start believing in you. God wants to take your blue fuzzy knit hat and trade it in for a hard shell helmet. God wants to take you from wah, wah, wah to war, war, war. God wants to take your teddy and make you ready. God wants you to take you from depending on mommy to relying on the Messiah. God wants to transform your midnight cries for self into midnight cries for souls. God wants to take your bottle and give you a Bible. God wants to take your way, he wants to take away your rattle and put you in the saddle. God wants to deliver you from diaper rash so you can hear the armor clash. God wants to take you from baby food to soul food. Here we go tonight. I got three points. God wants your blankie. You hear me? God wants your blankie. <laughs> Friend, if I hadn't given up this trash from the world when I got saved, you know what I'm talking about, all that little junk, all that cargo you've been carrying all your life, all that stuff that you drag along in life, some of you have been going through the same thing over and over and over again for years. See, we got kids. You know how we got them off the pacifier? And I love pacifiers, friend. I mean, I plug their face in a heartbeat. <laughs> but when those pacifiers were gone, they were gone. We'd buy like a dozen of them, and then there'd be 10, then there'd be, you know, nine and seven, and, you know, dog would eat one, there'd be six, and, and then we'd tell little Kelsey, you know, this is the last passy. This is the last passy. When this passy gone, no, no more, this is it, the last passy. You understand? It's over when you lose this passy. It's gone. But some of you friends, God will take away one thing. You go right out and get another. You'll get whatever it takes to pacify you when God's trying to raise you up. Here's the points. Number one, it's time. Say it's time. For everyone within the sound of my voice to get rid of your blankie of rebellion. Now, this is going to hurt some folks, but just take it. Blankie of rebellion. You know what rebellion is? It's opposition to someone who's in authority. And I want to tell you, friend, there is one authority. His name is Jesus Christ, and he has everything under control, and he wants you. In the first Samuel 15, 23, it says, For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. Friend, that is one heavy scripture. First Samuel 15, 23. Ezekiel 20, verse 16, listen to these. Because they despise my judgments and walked not in my statutes but polluted my Sabbaths for their heart went after their idols thank God for this nevertheless nevertheless mine eyes spared them from destroying them neither did I make them an end make an end of them in the wilderness rebellion God tells you to do something and you don't do it Matthew 15 8 says this people draws nigh unto me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They honor me with the mouth. They praise me with the lips, but their heart is far from me. Everyone say rebellion. Now, some of you have been rebellious toward ridding yourself of sin. You say you love Jesus, and he says, if you love me, obey me. Keep my commandments, John 14, 15 says. Remember what Jesus said to the adulterous woman? He said to the adulterous woman, go and sin no more. 
He didn't say to the adulterous woman, every time you get in trouble, I'll be there to bail you out. You go ahead and go out and commit all the acts of adultery you want to, and when you commit that act, you can count on me. I'll be there right before they're about to throw stones at you. No, he turned to the woman, and he said this, Go! Give me that blankie! And sin no more! Your sinful lifestyle, what you've been used to, running around committing adultery, give me that. You're not going to look to men anymore. You're going to look to the Messiah. You're not going to look to people anymore. You're going to look to God from now on. Give me that blankie. Give me that security. Paul said, when I became a man, I put away childish things. And there's a lot of ways to interpret that scripture, friend. But tonight, we're talking about growing up in God. We're talking about growing up in God. Is anybody listening? The Bible talks about being a soldier. Those of you that just can't give up drugs, you better give up drugs. Drugs will take you down, friend. They'll bury you six feet under. But I'm just, I just can't do it. I'm too weak. What are you saying to, are you saying to Jesus that he ain't got the power to deliver you? What are you saying? Or is it that you really don't want to give up your blankie? A man came to me one night. I'm talking about sin. Sin is anything Jesus wouldn't do. A man came to me one night and he stood right here. And he stood here just like this. Matter of fact, you got that first one on there. I just need that baby cry right now. Here's what he said. He said, pray for me, preacher. That God would deliver me from my pornography problem. And this is how I saw him standing there with his finger, his thumb in his mouth, and his blankie. You got that tape? Is there a baby in the house? Is there anybody? Pinch your kid. <laughs> I need a sound effect. This is what he was doing. He said, pray for me, preacher, that God would deliver me from my pornography problem. You know what I said? Cut it. Cut the nursery. And I said, I said, sir, I am not going to pray that God would deliver you from your porno problem. I want you to quit looking at pornography. I pray that God will give you strength and all, but goodness, friend, it's time for you to turn your head. It's time for you to walk into a store. You're not going to ever get rid of nudity, friend. It's all around the world, everywhere you go. It's time for you to close your eyes. It's time for you to turn your head and run from it. Flee the appearance of evil. It's time for you to give up the blankie. God wants the blankie. He wants you to give it up. I was harsh to the man, but he sure understood. I said, sir... See this? I said, that's a neck. Turn it. Use it. When someone comes in front of you that's half naked, turn your head. And if that don't work, close your eyes. People say, oh, pray for me that God will deliver me from my, my pornography problem. But they still get up at 1 o'clock in the morning, tiptoe upstairs, slide into the computer seat, and log on to some website and watch filth for a half hour. And then they'll come to the Brownsville Revival and ask me to pray for them for deliverance. No, friend, turn the computer off. God wants your blankie. Oh, I can feel the presence of God in this place. Sin. I'm telling you, friend, sin is what took Jesus to the cross. Listen up at home. I'm, I'm tired of another thing. I'm tired of everybody displaying Jesus as some type of Santa Claus, as some type of, uh, some type of jewel dealer that he's just out there just, just, just giving out gifts and just loving on everybody. My, G, my Jesus has scars on his hands. My Jesus has scars on his feet. My Jesus has whip burns across his back. He, my Jesus was beaten, bloody. Not that you could have a new car. Not that you could have a new house. Not that you could have a nice suit of clothes. He died to take away the sin of the world. That's why he died. He 
died to redeem you from a perishing hell. You were going to hell, and he looked down from heaven. The Bible says that he emptied himself of heaven, everything he had, and he said, I'm going to go down to that dusty earth, and I'm going to breathe their smog. I'm going to get among their filth. I'm going to listen to them cuss, and I'm going to walk for 33 years, and I'm going to be around them, and I'm going to let them spit on me. I'm going to let them mock me. I'm going to let them make fun of me because I love them, and I'm going to love them so much. I'm going to prove my love. I'm going to let them beat me. I'm going to let them whip me. I'm going to let them spit on me. I'm going to let them blindfold me and mock me as a king. I'm going to let them take a crown of thorns and put it on my head. I'm going to let them take my back and plow it like a plow would plow a field. I'm going to let them pierce my hands and pierce my feet because I love them. Friend, that's how much Jesus loves you and how much he hates sin. Man is a sinner for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Your sin separates you from God. And I want to tell you right now, friend, God's tired of being separated from you. He loves you. He loves you. I'm experiencing right now just a little separation from my kids. My, my youngest son, my, my, my son who's 11, he goes off to a ministry trip and he's gone for a week. And as soon as he's gone, I miss him, man. I miss my boy. I miss him. And even though he's in the work of the Lord, I miss him, man. I miss his laugh. I miss his, his cuddles. I, li I miss talking to him. What it must be like for God, who loves every one of us the same, and for this big wall of sin to be between you and him. And, oh, friend, you can take that wall down tonight. I'm telling you, God wants your blankie. Whatever you're holding on to, Jesus Christ shed his blood on Calvary. You've been rebellious. Some people here have been rebellious toward yielding yourself to God's will for your life. I'm talking about rebellion. Rebellion is, is bucking up against one in authority, God's will. You've got a plan. You've got a blankie. I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. This is what I've always wanted to do all my life. I want to get married, have two kids, a nice house, and a new car. This is what I want. This is what I'm going to do. I want. I forgive me, translators, for moving so fast. I want a nice job, a new car, a family, a house. This thing's being translated in like seven languages tonight. So. But you've got all these plans. You've got your blankie before the Lord. And you're standing before God Almighty, the one who knits you together in your mother's womb. And you're going, this is what I want. All my life, this is what I wanted to do. And God's saying, I want you to go to the mission field. I don't want to go to the mission field. I want to pastor a church in suburbia with 250 members that tithe to me. And God says, I got to work for you in Ethiopia. Jesus said in John 14, 23, it's recorded, if a man loves me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Jesus said, when you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. By the way, Jesus practiced what he preached. In the garden, when he was going through that earthly struggle, foreseeing Calvary, he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Friend, I'm talking about the blankie of rebellion. What are you rebelling against God over? Some of you, God is calling you to the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry, but you've got a business back home. You've got a good life back home, but God's gnawing at your heart. You can feel it. You know it's him. You can be sitting next to another person that's not feeling a thing. Because God's not calling them, but God's calling you, and you know it. God wants your blankie. He wants your security blanket. The things that mean a lot to you. Number two, Teddy fell over. He's cute, isn't he? You want me to throw you out in the crowd? <laughs> you want Patrick to hold you? He go, Pat, he feels safe with you. <laughs> In 
It's time for everyone. What's the first point tonight? Blanky of? It's time for everyone within the sound of my voice to get rid of your blanky of self-righteousness. Blanky of self-righteousness. Jesus spoke harshly about self-righteousness. Many of you are so pious. I get around people, Mike, when a sinner comes into a church that looks a little different, you'll see these people stick their nose in the air. It's like, well, in a year or two, I might speak to them. But right now, they're not worthy of my company. I've been in this church 17 years. Until they dress properly, until they smell correctly, they'll have no part of my fellowship. Your blankie of self-righteousness. You're cloaked in it, friend. It stinks. It's ratted just like this blanket right here. And I want to tell you something. People can see it. And it's like a child who's eight years old that's dragging this thing around. You look at a child who's eight walking around with this thing. You think, what on earth? Why can't that kid shake that? And I see Christians been in the walk of the Lord for 20 years, and they're still hung up on prejudice. They're still hung up on black and white, Vietnamese and Hispanic. They're still hung up on stupid, idiotic issues. Little blankie of bias, bigotry. God wants your blankie, friend. Self-righteous. Jesus spoke harshly. One of the things I love about what's going on right now is there's a youth revival going on right now. Amen? Let me tell you. Let me tell you what's going to happen with this youth revival, friend. If you got problems, you're in for major problems. Because these young people ain't got those problems. They want everybody to get saved. Everybody! Red, yellow, black, and white. Big, little, drug addicts, alcoholics, Wall Street men. It don't matter to them. They want everybody to be saved. They want them to pile them all together and worship God. Whew. Jesus said, take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. This is Matthew 6, 1 through 8. You can read it when you get home. But he talked boldly and plainly. Then he got a little bit heavier in Matthew 23, 25. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whitened sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity self-righteousness let me give you a clue friend if it wasn't for God you wouldn't be alive how can we dare boast of anything of ourselves you think you're somebody when I was doing the interview today this reporter was just elevating the revival and you know it's just because you know millions of people have come through and it's it's affecting all over the world and I explained to people we are nobodies I am a nobody I'm the scum of the earth man and I, I am surprised when people say to me I can't believe you're talking to me the other day a young lady called she's 18 years old or 20 years old she's in a ministry and she's a daughter of someone here in this church and she had a major problem in the ministry. And she called our office. And we have a lot of staff. We have thousands of calls coming through all the time. One day we got 860 pieces of mail in one day. And we, we try to process everything. And we do the very best we can. But the call came all the way through to my office. And she said this, I can't believe I'm talking to you. And I said, why? Because you are your Steve. And 
you're so busy. And I said, I'm busy with you. I'm busy with people. You. Nobody's anybody. You never get to a place, Pastor, where you're above anybody you never get to the place where you rise above the people that come to minister be ministered to you never get to the place in God where you're suddenly floating in a cloud above everyone and you're looking down with a pious look on your face like you have something that they don't have and you're better than they are friend you're all the same everyone's the same we're all the same at the foot of the cross Paul told the church of Galatians, for if a man, this is 6.3, for if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Our best is as filthy rags. Isaiah puts it this way, 64.6, but we are all, I told you we preach the Bible here. I told you we preach the Bible. If you get tired of Scripture, it's your problem. Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. I'm going to close in just a minute, friend, but your blankie of self-righteousness, it better go out the door. It better go out the door. And my last one tonight. First was a blankie of... Second one was a blankie of God wants your blankie. Number three, and my final point. It's time for everyone within the sound of my voice to get rid of your blankie of religion. These are all our words, by the way, the blankie. Yeah. Blankie of religion. This is probably, Mike, the most difficult of all. You got that back there? We need to nursery cry. You know, revival breaks out. Pastors, this is what happens. Revival breaks out, and you hear all these babies crying. Yeah? You know? What do you mean we got to stay up in revival services? I'm going to miss my sitcom. I don't want to come to prayer meeting. We were doing just fine on Sunday mornings. What do you mean you want me to work on a prayer team? That's soccer night. I want to be at the soccer games with my boy. <laughs> Friend. Oh, how I wish I could do that in the church. <laughs> Nip it. <laughs> Revival breaks out. Here's what's a hoot. Revival breaks out. See, in my library, Mike, Mike's got the same in his. We both got extensive libraries. I love my library. And I've got old journals. I've got one book from a woman who used to travel on the, and as a prayer ministry team. It's her journal from the prayer ministry of George Whitfield. She, it's all from behind the scenes. It's incredible stuff. And old Wesleyan meetings where the power came down. Whitfield, Wesley, Charles Finney. Those of you that are shaken under the power in the baptismal pool, they saw that years ago. Go back to Cane Ridge back in 1801. You ain't seen nothing. They'd look at that baptismal pool and they'd go, well, you know. Their hair is not popping like a, like a whip, but it's, you know, they're jerking pretty, yeah. <laughs> They'd say, that's, yeah, that's light. That's a lighter manifestation of the Spirit. But you'll have people, as soon as the Spirit of God moves, they're so stuck in religion. They'll come and they'll go, Pastor, I need to talk to you. And they'll sit down in his office and they'll go, I don't like all this falling down stuff. Or they'll even do it self righteous They'll come and they'll walk in there like this. Pastor, we need to talk to you right now. All this shaking under the power stuff and all this falling down, it's going to stop or you're out of here. Do you understand? And you don't believe me, read my blankie. <laughs> That's what they do. 
the blankie of religion. It's their way of doing things. They've always done it all their lives like that, and bless the Lord, they're not going to change. It's my security. I don't want to sing loud. I don't want to jump up and down. We just don't do that. But you read the old literature. And the church was founded in praise and worship and the power coming down. You read in John chapter 3 about Nicodemus. Nicodemus walked up to Jesus at night with a blankie. The Bible says in John 3, 2, he says, The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, he was doing this. You ever seen a baby rub their blankie like that? He said, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus is answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. About that time, Nicodemus is rubbing his blankie even harder. <laughs> Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit. About this time, Nicodemus goes like this. What are you saying to me, Jesus? Jesus. Believe on me, Nicodemus. I am the light of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But all that I've been taught, everything I know, I am the fulfillment, Nicodemus, of everything you've been taught. Lay it down. Lay it down. Lay it down. And Nicodemus becomes a believer in Jesus. Then another group of people, they're standing around listening to Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And he says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Just as your fathers did, so do you. They're standing before Stephen going, who do you think you are? Can't you see our blankies? <laughs> Jesus. Oh, friend, I'm talking about the blankie of religion. See, religion's hanging around the cross. Christianity's getting on the cross. Jesus said, and it's recorded in Matthew 7, 21, I'm closing, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. But Mike, many are going to take their blankies to heaven. Listen to what they're going to do. They're going to stand before God on judgment day, and they're going to say, Lord, we have prophesied in your name. We've cast out devils. We've done many wonderful works, and Jesus is going to say, I don't know you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquities. Take your blankies and go. Your security, all the things that you did, but you never did them out of relationship with me. You did it out of religion. I'm warning everyone here that's working out of, rela out of religion, just some type of duty to God, but you don't know God. You better turn it around quick tonight, friend. Everything I do is out of a passionate love for Jesus. Everything I do. Well, you've heard me say you can go to hell with a choir robe on. These are all blankies. Oh, rapture comes. You're still standing there. Oh. <laughs> You're going to get to sing your solo after all, sis. <laughs> and there will probably be a lot of people there listening to you. 
You can go to hell with a communion cup in your hand and a wafer in your mouth. You can go to hell with a certificate of ordination hanging behind your desk. These are blankies. You can go to hell with baptismal waters dripping from your face. Did you remember the one tonight that was baptized four times? And she said, all those times it meant nothing. You know what that was? That's a blankie. That's what that is. Be baptized. Okay. Security. Blankie. That's a blankie. Those are religious acts that meant nothing, friend. But when you get baptized and it means something, you know who he is. You know who you are. You're dying to the old man. Then it's something different. You can go to hell with a tithe envelope in one hand and the offering plate in the other. You can go to hell with a hymn book in your hand and a song in your mouth. You can go to hell with a yes, Lord, we will ride with you bumper sticker on your car. You can go to hell with a WWJD bracelet on. You can go to hell with 20 Christian t-shirts hanging in your closet. You can go to hell with a box full of Point of Grace, DC Talk, Carmen, Avalon, and Rebecca St. James tapes in your car. You can be the highest jumper, the most rhythmic dancer, the most intense singer, and the loudest amener, and still go to hell if you don't know Jesus. God wants your blankie. Everybody stand. Charity, I want you to come join me. Nobody moving around? Friend, if you knew how serious this is tonight, and I know we've had a little fun, but you've got the point of the message. How many understand the message tonight? Lift your hand. I thought you did. You're going to get rid of this tonight, whatever it is. You're going to get it out of your life. Whatever's holding you back. When I first got saved, God made me become sensitive to him. I became sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I had never been sensitive to God. But as an early Christian, I became sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And I became more sensitive than my peers. Little things started bothering me. I want everyone to listen to me and listen carefully. Little things started bothering me. For example, if I saw a woman walking down the road and I glanced at her and then I glanced back at her again and it was a provocative thing, it would come over me like a wet blanket over my spirit. And I was watching other guys, no problem. They wouldn't have no problem at all. But it started bothering me. And I was a man who used to live on the streets I ran with the party crowd. I did whatever I wanted to do. But now I was a Christian. And God was getting rid of everything in my life that was going to hinder my walk with him. Lay aside every sin that so easily besets you. Act like a man. Be strong. Lay it down. Act like a woman of God. Lay it down. Whatever it is tonight, friend, you're going to come to this altar and you're going to pour your heart out to Jesus you're going to get that last security blanket out of your life and you're going to be free to go forward with Jesus I want to tell you when I spoke last night spoke last night a message entitled inside the circle those of you that weren't here I talked about in the multitude of counselors there's wisdom and I talked about the power of godly men and women that have been around me and that need to be around you. And you need to surround yourself with that type of counsel. Well, I want to tell you something. When you're surrounded with that kind of counsel, it doesn't always go your way. Let me say that again. They, they may not want you to marry that girl that you want to marry. They may think it's wrong. It's easy to obey people when it's going your way. But when they got some type of contrary opinion, you stick your blankie in their face. You go, I want my way. This is my way. I'm in love. I've known her for two months. I'm going to marry her. <laughs> I remember when we were going to the mission field, Jerry and I, with all our hearts, wanted to go to Argentina. All our hearts. We'd already been there, already ministered. We are going to Argentina. We'd already told the people in Argentina. We'd already found a place that we wanted to live down there, the neighborhood. In Buenos Aires, we were going to Argentina as missionaries with the Assemblies of God. 
A few months later, we sat around this huge table from India at 1445 Boonville Avenue in Springfield, Missouri. This huge wood inlaid table from India, and around it were all these seasoned missionaries. Some of them were 75, 80 years old. And one of them looked at me. The head of the Assemblies of God Foreign Missions Department looked at me. See, he wanted to see if I had a blankie in my hand. He wanted to see if Steve Hill had a blankie. And he looked at me and he said, so you want to go to Argentina? And Jerry and I both said, yes, sir, we do. And he said, we've been talking about it and we're going to send you to Africa instead. You ever had your heart set on something? Really set? And the opposite happens? That's what this was. We're sending you to the jungles instead. Buenos Aires had 12 million people in it. It's a metropolitan. It's Paris of South America that needed churches desperately. They were talking about going from there, instead of that, going to the jungles of Africa. I wanted to learn Spanish. They wanted to teach me. They wanted me to go in, in the jungles and learn another dialect that I'd never use again the rest of my life if I ever left the mission field. They said, we're going to send you to Africa. And Jerry and I looked at each other, and we looked straight into his eyes, and we said, fine. Send us to Africa. We're ready. And it blew their minds. You know what they didn't see? A blankie. They saw freedom in us. And the director of the Division of, Home, of Foreign Missions looked me in the eyes and he said, eh, you can go to Argentina. <laughs> Those of you in the front with the chairs, move them to the left and the right. Those of you with the chairs, move them to the left and the right. Everyone remain standing. And if you're thinking about slip, slipping off to the bathroom, maybe you don't know God or you're backslidden, you're trying to get away, we have speakers in the bathroom, so. <laughs> we, um, we clued into that trick about three years ago. The old hanging out in the bathroom till the altar call's over. Now, Charity's going to sing Mercy Seat. Mercy is undeserved forgiveness. Tonight, you've heard the gospel probably 25 times. You've heard it through song. You've heard it from the baptismal pool. You've heard it in this message. Jesus loves you, has a plan for your life, but he's ready, friend, for you to shake this loose. If it's, if it's sin in your life, he's ready for you to get it out. Now, some of you may not even think you have a blankie that you're holding on to, but I'm telling you, friend, if what you're watching at home cannot be watched on Sunday morning in front of the whole church, then it's sin. I've had people come up to me and ask me this question. In the revival, they'll name a movie and ask me if I've gone to see it. And it blows my mind that they'll ask me that question because I know about the movie. I know the rating on the movie, and I know the sex scenes in the movie because other people have told me what's in the movie. And people have come up to me and said, have you seen it yet? It's awesome. I'm going, there's nudity. And they'll go, not that much. I'm going, can you show it on Sunday morning in front of the whole church? Would you, would you turn red in embarrassment as those nude scenes come on, as that lovemaking goes on? Would you be embarrassed in front of, if you're embarrassed at church, you should be embarrassed at home. There's not a Jesus at church and a Jesus at home. There's only one Jesus, and he stands for holiness. He stands for righteousness. He stands for godliness, and it's time to get him in your life. By the way, this is why God has kissed the Brownsville Revival. He has kissed it because we preach getting right with God, getting holy. Because I want to tell you, I love healings, friend. I love healings. I love them, but I'd hate for you to 
go to hell, you know, healed of cancer. Whoop de doo. Go to hell, and you were he your your back problem was healed, but you went to hell. I've seen enough of that stuff. I want to see people saved. I want to see you saved. I want to see you healed, but I want to see you saved. I want to see you saved. I want, to, I want everyone in this room and everyone in the Family Life Center to know and everyone at home to know without a shadow of a doubt that if you should die after this service, you'd be ushered right into the presence of God and he would say, come on in. There would be no hesitation. There's no hesitation in your mind where you would go when you die. Look this way, everybody. Charity's going to sing mercy seat. Everyone in this room that's backslidden, you need Jesus Christ to forgive you. You need Jesus Christ to wash you clean. You're going to come in just a minute. You're going to come. You need Jesus Christ to wash you clean. You need to get the sin out of your life. You're going to come. Everyone in this room that's never known the Lord, you're going to come. Everyone in the Family Life Center, you don't know Jesus. I want to invite you to come and meet the Savior of your soul. I want you to come and meet your very best friend. You're going to meet the one friend who can change you forever. He can, 23 years ago, he delivered me from drugs and alcohol and rebellion. I dropped my blankie 23 years ago, went on with God. He delivered me from everything. Those of you with mental problems, mind problems, just constantly plagued by mind games, God can deliver you. He can set you free, but you've got to repent of your sin. You've got to give your life to Jesus tonight. Pour your guts out to the Lord. Give him everything tonight. He'll be your very best friend. Those of you in this room, and those of you in overflow, and those of you at home that are religious, but you don't know Jesus, you're going to drop that blankie at the cross tonight. God wants your blankie. He wants you to turn it over. You can go to church, friend, and not know Jesus. You're supposed to be the bride. The Bible says the church is the bride of Christ, that he is the groom. I meet people that call themselves Christians. They're token on cigarettes. They're cussing. They call themselves Christians. You know what that is to me? That's a bride. That's a bride st about to get married with stains and junk all over their, their clothes. They're not going to go at a wedding like that, and you know it. And that groom's not going to accept them like that. When I got married to Jerry, she came in the most beautiful gown, spotless, a glow on her face, madly in love with me, and I was madly in love with her, and we still are. That's the way it's supposed to be. And when Jesus comes back, you're supposed to, it's supposed to be a continuum. You've been in love with him, worshiping him. You can't wait, just like an engaged couple can't wait to get married. You can't wait to be with him. And then when he, the trumpet sounds and he splits open the sky, you're going, it's him, and you're out of here. There's rarely a week that goes by where my wife and I aren't talking about going home to be with Jesus. We would love to go be with Jesus. Love it. I love my kids, but I've told all my kids, I would rather go be with Jesus than be on this planet. I would rather, and I want my kids to be just that way. I don't want them to grow up and get so in love with sports, so in love and putting their roots down so deep with family and friends that they don't want Jesus to come back. I'm asking you, religious person, do you know him? Do you wake up in the morning, young person, with Jesus on your heart? Do you go to sleep at night with Jesus on your heart? Do you eat, drink, and breathe Jesus? Is he a consuming thing to you? Is he always around you? Are you always thinking about him? Or is he somebody that you just put him on a shelf? Or he hangs from a, 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 a cross on your dashboard? Uh, is, he, is he somebody that, that is just, you turn him on on Sunday morning and turn him off Sunday afternoon so you can watch a game. Then you turn him on back again on Sunday night so you can go to church. Then you turn him off on Monday morning and you turn him back on Wednesday night to go to church. Friend, that's trash. Do you know him? 
Tonight, you can give your life to Jesus. Come down here. You're going to take that blanket. You're going to throw it down. That religion, you're going to throw it down. You'll say, God ain't never going to pick that thing up. That is over. That's junk. You don't want me. In. You want me to grow up. You want me to act like a man. You want me to act like a woman of God. I'm sick of all this stuff, and you're sick of it. I'm going to be a soldier. Charity's going to sing mercy seat. Now, the only thing that's going to keep you back is pride. Pride will say, I don't need to go down there. I can take care of this right in my own seat, friend. There you go again. That blankie of rebellion. I just can't go down there. I just can't do it. Friend, shake it loose. Drop it at the cross. Come down and get right with Jesus. It doesn't matter who's here with you. You're by yourself. If you came with a van of 20, we had a bus pull up just a few minutes ago. It doesn't matter, friend, if 50 people came with you. You're here by yourself. God's not going to take all 50 of you to heaven all at once, and you're going to all stand together as a group, and, and, and they say, well, this group seems all right to me. Let's let this group in. No, friend, one at a time, one person at a time, you better be right. I'm going to give this altar call. If you need to get Jesus into your heart, if you need forgiveness, if you've been away from God, you're going to come quickly. You're not going to hesitate. You're going to shake that pride off of you. If you need Jesus Christ to forgive you, I want you to come right now. Charity, I want you to sing mercy seat. If you need forgiveness, hurry right now. Hurry right now and kneel at this altar. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hurry. Hurry. Hurry and kneel at the altar. In the Family Life Center, kneel at the altar. Come on. is unknown. I face the power. Of sin on my own. Come on. I did Come not on. know Come on. of a place Come on. I could go. Where Friend, I if you didn't catch the beginning of this message, this is a blanket. It's a child's blanket that was turned in by a kid who said, I'm ready to give up my blanket. He was an older kid. She was an older kid, ready to give it up, ready to turn it over. But you know what this symbolizes? This symbolizes all the junk we don't give over to God. God's saying, grow up. God's saying, go after me with all your heart. God's saying, it's time to be a soldier. It's time to be a woman. It's time to be a man of God. But we keep holding on to these securities. We keep holding on to rebellion. We keep holding on to religion. We keep holding on to our self-righteousness. It's time to shake it off. Get the sin out of your life. Throw the blanket down and say, Jesus, I turn it over to you. Receive him as Savior right now. Ask him to wash you. Ask him to cleanse you. Ask him to make you new. There's someone in Orlando right now. You're watching this. Sir, you've watched the broadcast before, but when it came altar call time, when it came altar call time, you always thought that's for somebody else. It's not for somebody else. It's for you. Kneel right there in your home. Kneel right there in your home. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Where hope has not Come on. Been. Come on. Hurry. Lost Hurry. in the curse. Everyone at the altar, stay right where you're at. Just kneel right there. Come on. In the Family Life Center, let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Turn it over. Turn it over. But I know Turn it over. Come on. Come on in the Family Life Center. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on in the bleachers. Let's go. Upstairs, let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on. He'll wash you. He'll cleanse you. He'll make you brand new. Come on. 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 His grace will be a covering. His blood will flow freely. God bless you, sir. God bless you.
Everyone at the altar, keep your heads bowed. I'm going to close this altar call. Everyone at the altar, don't move. Stay right where you're at. Everyone in the Family Life Center at the altar, stay right where you're at. But down here, God's not finished. I'm going to give you one more chance, and we're closing the altar. I'm going to give you one more chance. Some of you need some help. Some of you in the balcony need some help. You need someone to help you. I'm going to close this altar call after this right here. I'm going to have Lyndall sing a couple choruses of Lord Have Mercy. And everyone's going to turn to the person next to them. You're going to ask them this question. Do you need Jesus Christ to forgive you? Don't do it yet. You're going to ask them that question. When somebody turns to you, don't lie. And they ask you that question, don't lie. Don't say that's fine if you still got sin in your life. I want to tell you something. Some of you are really struggling with God's will for your life. Those of you at the altar, I want you to keep your heads bowed. We got a pastor here who was a Catholic priest in Mexico, Pastor Aurelio, right here. He's right here. He's 75 years old. He had about 10,000 people in his church, and then he got saved in Mexico, a priest in the Catholic church. He had religion. He had religion. He had the esteem of the community. He had a great following. And he knew that if he started announcing what the Holy Spirit had done in his life, that it would mean excommunication from the church. But guess what he did? He did exactly that. He announced it. He allowed God. You know what he did? He took that blanket of security, the years of Catholicism, and he took it and he laid it down. He said, Jesus, I'm going on with you. Oh, it's a long story, friend, and we don't have time. Maybe tomorrow night I want him to share some of it with you. But now he's had crowds in the open air up to 200,000 people. I want to tell you what God, you lay it down tonight, friend. You lay whatever's holding you back, you lay it down. You lay it down. And he ministers to tens of thousands constantly now. But he's had crowds up to 20, 200,000. But he didn't know that back when he was excommunicated. He took a stand. You take a stand, friend, lay it down. Lay down the pride. Lay down the arrogance. Lay down your dreams. Lay it all down. Everyone's going to turn to the person next to them, and you're going to ask them this question. Do you need Jesus Christ to forgive you? When someone asks you that question, do not lie. And then if they say yes, both of you come together. Come on, everyone do it right now. Then both of you come together. Everyone at the altar, stay where you're at. You're all right. Everyone at the altar, stay right where you're at. Bring them with you. That's it. If you're coming, come on. I'm going to close. Ten seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. We're waiting on you. Three. God bless you. God bless you. Yeah, come on down. That's good, man. You need to hurry for God. Come on. Come on. This is Reveille for some of you. Reveille. It's wake up time. Wake up time. Get serious with God. He'll get serious with you. I want everyone at this altar to bow your heads and pray with me right now. Bow your heads and pray out loud. Don't mumble. Dear Jesus, thank you for speaking to me. Tonight, Jesus, I lay it all down. 
I ask you to forgive me for I have sinned. Wash me clean. I'm sorry. I have done things that have grieved you. Forgive me. Tonight, Jesus, I ask that you be my Savior, be my Lord, and my very best friend. From this moment on, I am yours, and you are mine. Jesus, come live your life through me. I give myself to you in your precious name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah.